Lecture 24, Concurrency in File Systems. All right, this is a two-part topic, uh, and it's really the last one that we're going to talk about that is explicitly on the subject of concurrency. Um, that topic has been the biggest one uh, in the course, and we've spent a tremendous amount of time on it, um, but it is drawing to a close after this. Uh, we have sort of one remaining unit, uh, and that unit is about asynchronous I.O., um, but before we get there, we want to revisit the file system a little bit, um, something that we talked about oh, back in the beginning. This was, uh, I think, Lecture 3. Uh, and this time we need to peel back the curtain a little bit and uh, see what goes on a little bit underneath so we can have a better understanding. Uh, and also, this is a way to introduce a couple of other uh, mechanisms for concurrency that we have not yet examined okay so yeah um i mean there is a file system interface and we know how that works we know how to create a file and read from a file and write to a file and everything at that point this is all well established uh and we understand that the operating system will just do what we ask uh and it will you know, deliver the the data that we asked to read for example good now um we have to know a little more about what's going on. Uh, and the thing is that um, files can be of arbitrary size, although a given file system uh, may have a limit. So you might be unable to create a file if it's, say, more than uh, 4 gigabytes. So that, that might be an actual uh, concern. But, uh, you know, those kinds of things are uh, the exception. Most of the time, a file can be of any arbitrary size that we desire. So um, they have to be stored on disk, and in this case, disk doesn't have to be a physical disk, you know, like hard drive kind of thing. It can be a solid state device, could be a USB device, doesn't matter. It has to be stored somewhere using some strategy. Uh, and the first strategy that we want to talk about is contiguous allocation. So a file occupies a set of blocks, and the blocks are all adjacent on disk. Uh, that is to say, you know, there's no gaps uh, between any of the blocks that belong to the same file. So a file is allocated, you start at block B, and this file is n blocks in size, then the file takes up the starting block B, and then the next one B plus 1, B plus 2, and so on, all the way up to B plus and minus one. Um, and this is great if you want to read the file sequentially, um, because uh, when we want to, uh, um, if you're reading from a solid state drive or USB drive or any flash media or something like that, the order of reads is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. But if you are using a hard drive, then actually the order of reads matters, uh, and accessing an adjacent block is, of course, you know, faster than going to a random block located somewhere else on the disk. Now, um, you might say, and, and you would have, you know, to some extent, a point, that solid state drives are here, uh, you know, they're not even really the future anymore, they are the present, uh, and nobody uses magnetic drives anymore. That's not true. Uh, if you wanted to build a uh, NAS, Network Attached Storage, uh, if you had a very large database, something like that, uh, you just had backup drives, anything like that, um, magnetic drives are fine. Um, they are still uh, quite a lot cheaper per terabyte of storage, uh, and they get the job done. Um, I mean, if you built a NAS, I don't know if they even make 10 terabyte solid state drives, but uh, if you wanted to get four of them, that would be horrendously expensive uh, and doesn't doesn't get anything. So we will talk about in our discussion of this uh, you know, hard drive uh, interaction as if there is a um, spinning magnetic hard drive. Just think of that as the worst case scenario. In the best case scenario, it doesn't matter. In the worst case scenario, then that's what we're looking at. So if you want to access a particular block uh, and you know, you're already um, accessing its neighbor, well, no problem, you just keep going uh, and it's very easy. So seek time is non-existent to minimal. Um, and so to you know, find the file, um, you just keep in a record somewhere. This is the file, this is where it's located. Uh, and the information about the file is just the start location and the length and it tells you exactly how many blocks are 
there. Uh, and sequential and direct access are easy. If you need to go to a specific block, that's direct access. So you just calculate the offset. Um, if it's sequential, then you just read it. Uh, and also checking if this is a valid part of the file is easy too, because, well, all you, you can just calculate, you know, is the offset less than you know, n, you know, the number of blocks, times the size of block. Uh, and if it is, then you know it's in a valid range and everything's fine. Okay, um, so contiguous allocation in you know a very painfully simple system where you know er there are 32 blocks and um, uh, so it's the tiniest USB drive imaginable uh, and so you have various files they have a start a length and uh, it's all laid out in the diagram. Okay. There are, of course, difficulties with contiguous allocation. Uh, if you want to find a block of uh, size n, uh, can we find a contiguous block in memory, for example, when you know, we're allocating it for uh, memory? That is an interesting question. Um, the answer, I mean, in memory is probably yes, uh, and the answer on disk is also probably yes, but you do have to consider the case of no. What if we can't find one uninterrupted chunk big enough to contain the entire file, what do we do? Uh, and then of course if there is more than one block, which one of those do we choose? Uh, so that's not necessarily obvious either uh, about how to most efficiently put files on disk. Um, and as before, there is the possibility of external fragmentation and internal fragmentation. Um, the slide shouldn't actually reference as before because those concepts haven't been introduced yet, but external fragmentation is what happens when you have a little slice between two files and it's not big enough to be useful. Uh, consider, if you will, that you have like two meetings that are 15 minutes apart. So like you get out of your sprint planning meeting at 10.30 uh, and then at 10.45 you have a, a call with the customer service team you probably can't accomplish very much useful in that 15 minutes you know go make a cup of coffee at best you know um, but that's you know not necessarily useful work time and so that kind of thing is external fragmentation there's a little slice it's not actually allocated to a file or in the case of the analogy to your meeting but you can't really use it for anything either because it's so small it's not practical. Uh, and internal fragmentation is what happens when you know, the file is not an even number uh, of bytes as a multiple of the uh, block size. So if this file is two and a half bytes, well, uh, sorry, two and a half blocks, then we have to allocate enough bytes for three blocks. Uh, and the last half block is wasted, it's allocated to this file, but it's not being used, and that is internal fragmentation. My analogy about meetings doesn't work so well here, but like just imagine, if you will, um, that meetings always had to uh, go to an even multiple of half hours. So if you had a meeting and it was over in 45 minutes, but you weren't allowed to leave the room until 60 minutes had elapsed because you have to round up to the next half hour. Okay, I don't think that one would actually happen. Um, but it is funny to imagine. But funny, strange, not funny. Ha ha. Okay, there's another problem with contiguous allocation, which is how much space is a file going to take? Uh, and you can't necessarily know that in advance, right? Um, if we're just copying a file and pasting it, we know how big it's going to be. If we're downloading a file from the internet, the server will say, be aware that the file you want to download is 51 megabytes, and we'll say, yes, it's 51 megabytes. We will allocate space accordingly. However, if a user opens a document, how big is it going to be? Is this, you know, just a sort of brief document where I'm just going to write down some notes. Is this my master's thesis? You know, um, they are wildly different in size and we don't know in advance. So if you have to, you will probably guess the size and if you allocate too little, you have to, you know, tax space on the end until there is an adjacent file, in which case to keep it contiguous, you have to move the file and reallocate it. Um, and if the value we choose for the starting set is very large, then a significant amount of space gets wasted, um, which is not fun. So you might say, well, that's dumb. Let's not do contiguous allocation. I don't like it. It sucks. 
and you wouldn't be wrong. So linked allocation is a solution to the problems of contiguous allocation, and that is instead of a file being all in consecutive blocks, you just maintain a linked list of the blocks, and the blocks themselves could be located anywhere on disk. Uh, and a directory listing just tells you where the first and the last ones are. So if you're reading like a physical newspaper, you might have seen this kind of thing. You'll read, there's an article on the first page, uh, and you will read up until you get to the end of space on the first page for this article, and we'll say, oh, continued on A5. Uh, and then you can flip to A5, and usually the article finishes there, but maybe it doesn't. Uh, and maybe it actually says after that, continued on A7, uh, or continued on opposite page, in which case you have to follow effectively another pointer to get to the next chunk of data. Uh, and that's the idea of linked allocation. Um, and so if you make a new file, the head and tail pointers will start out as null. If you need a new block, you can just find one anywhere on the disk and you just add it to the linked list. So you don't have to worry about keeping it compact and you don't have to worry about uh, relocating the file if you know, it can't all be kept in one contiguous chunk. So unfortunately, accessing a block of a file is no longer quite as simple as just computing an offset. It means we have to follow I pointers. Uh, and again, in the case of a magnetic drive, that's actually very slow because when we finish block one, we have to load block two. So we have to wait for the disk operation to complete. Uh, and then it will tell us, you know, the princess is in another castle uh, and we have to go into block three and so on and so on and so on. And we had to do all these intermediate reads that uh, honestly didn't give us anything. We weren't interested in the data, we just needed to know where to go next. So, yeah, um, contiguous allocation kind of sucks, and linked allocation isn't great either. Uh, and linked allocation is shown here on this slide, where you know, at the end we tell us, okay, this file has a start and an end, and there's a bunch of pointers that tell us where to go next. A possible solution to this, improving on the idea of linked allocation is uh, clusters. And a cluster will be comprised of four blocks. So you waste less memory maintaining pointers and improves disk access time. So it's sort of like grouping it up. So uh, every linked list is effectively four nodes all put together. Uh, and it saves you from having to load quite so many things to find where the next one is. Still not great. Um, so even if we do that, um, we still have the problem that accessing parts in the middle of the file is a pain because we're finding all these pointers and all these different blocks. And so our compromise option or uh, improved option is indexed allocation. And indexed allocation says, well, couldn't we just make a table of contents for our file? Um, and, I mean, that actually sounds like a good idea when we think about it. Now, if you uh, look at a book or the notebook version of the course notes, um, we you know, provide you a table of contents. Uh, the table of contents is very useful because, you know, if it is, oh, I have a question about deadlock, uh, I can look at the table of contents very quickly. Uh, I know where to find it. No, it's not too hard to come by. And I can say, oh, deadlock is you know, topic 17, 18, and 19 in this course. Uh, and then I can just skip right to the part that I want because it will say, okay, if you want deadlock, that's lecture 17 and it's on page X. Go there. Um, and so that's the idea of indexed allocation. So if you want to go to the middle of a file, we don't have to scroll through the whole file just to find out where the next page is located. We just check the index. Uh, and so that means the first block of the file contains effectively a whole bunch of pointers. It says, you know, here's the directions for the uh, table of contents. Uh, and to get to block I, we just look in the index block at the correct uh, entry in the table, and we get the location very efficiently. Uh, all pointers can start as null, and when you add a new block, you just put the entry into the table. So if I add a new lecture to the course, so I just rebuild the, uh, uh, the notes PDF, uh, and that you know, generates the new table of contents with the up-to-date information. Perfect. Uh, and so indexed allocation looks something like this. There's a couple of like oddities for what happens if your index block is full. You can you know, have a second index block, uh, which helps you out. You can think of that as being more like, um, you know, instead of just a simple book with a simple table of contents, you have like encyclopedia uh, set. And the encyclopedia set is huge and like really difficult. So you have a, a, a 
you have a guide that tells you which of the volumes that you want to look in. So you can say, okay, uh, I'm, I'm interested in, I don't know, lizards. Uh, and so lizards are in book eight. Uh, and then when you go to book eight, you can look at the uh, table of contents for book eight, and it tells you uh, where to find the information you want about lizards. Something like that. Um, and so, yeah, like many of the uh, allocation systems that we've talked about so far, we have to choose what the size of a block is. Um, it feels a little wasteful if a file only needs one block or two blocks to have a whole block allocated for pointers, but that's how it is. You know, having a whole page dedicated to a table of contents when the content of the document is only one page, maybe that seems dumb, but that's how the index allocation scheme works. Uh, and if you want more pointers than fit into a block, then we have to do a, a multi-level scheme, uh, as uh, I just gave an example of, or a linked scheme where it says actually the next block of index pointers is here. Um, so, yeah, you say, all right, once you get to the end of this table of contents, it would say table of contents continues on page X, and then you go there. Uh, and the combined scheme combines both the multi-level index and the linked scheme approach, uh, and that is actually what's used in Unix. So that's what we're going to focus on. So this is uh, a visual representation of an inode, uh, and an inode is the Unix structure for managing uh, managing a file. Uh, it is stored on you know, persistent storage, so your hard drive or a solid state drive or something like that. Uh, and uh, it is telling us everything that we need to know about the file. So the mode, those are um, permissions. So who are the owners of the file? That includes the, you know, the user and the group. Timestamps, things like when the file was last changed. Uh, number of blocks. And then we have direct blocks, Single indirect, double indirect, triple indirect. So there are um, 15 pointers of the index block that are in the inode structure. So the first 12 are the direct blocks and they point straight to data. So if you have an inode for a file uh, and the file is small, the data can be represented you know, in fewer than 12 blocks or 12 blocks or fewer, um, then what happens of course is that we just use the direct blocks uh, and they tell you here's where you find the blocks of the file and you don't need any additional index blocks. So that's the simple case. Uh, and then uh, if we have a um, more sizable file, then we need the pointer number 13, which is the single indirect. And the single indirect points to another uh, block, and that block is the index block. In the diagram, it's represented as having three uh, dots in it, uh, being pointed to from single indirect. Uh, and that gives us another whole uh, set of pointers to more data. So you know, it, we've got even more data. Uh, and double indirect block for files that are too big for single indirect uh, are represented by, again, we have our sort of top level index, uh, which points to, all right, this is the book in the encyclopedia that you want. And then we go to that book and then we look in the index for that book. And it points us to the data. And then, of course, we have the triple indirect block left in this diagram to the user's imagination. But, um, you know, we heard you like indirect blocks, so we put indirect blocks in your indirect blocks so you can reference indirect blocks while inside indirect blocks. Okay, so we've got that out of the way. Um, we've got an understanding now, hopefully, of an inode uh, and what it is and how it uh, how it's used. Um, and inode, as I say, is the uh, Unix-like operating system's representation of a file. Uh, and inodes are allocated and on disk, and every file is associated with an inode. Um, but now we are interested in talking about, well, sort of using it. Okay, so we already covered the idea of flock. Maybe you pronounce it flock, even though I don't favor that, uh, as a way of locking a file, and it locks the entire file. So that, um, I think, if you needed a refresher on that, we could look up um, by going back to Lecture 3, where we talked about it. Now, there exists another way to do this, where we can lock only part of a file using the file control function. 
Uh, I speculate that I will probably once again refer to this at some point as function control. That's just my brain filling in a blank um, incorrectly, so uh, just keep in mind it is in fact file control uh, as you would expect. Now, um, when we do the partial locking of something, that's referred to as record locking. Um, what a, what is a record? Well, if we have a data record in a file, it's something like that. Um, truthfully, we don't do this very much anymore because we use databases for this kind of thing. Uh, but it is a uh, it is a valid option, I suppose, if you have a file uh, as opposed to uh, using a database. Well, you might need to lock only part of the file as opposed to uh, the whole file in which case you can use this function now locking just a part of the file allows for more concurrency right um, if you have a file uh, that you know contains a lot of data you know it's data about lots of users or something um, then you can say well um, I could lock the whole file but that isn't optimal because so uh, why does so you know, messing with user A you know necessarily prevent you from doing anything with user B? Okay, so uh, file control takes the following arguments. Uh, it takes the file descriptor that you want to perform the operation on, a command. Command is an integer, but it will generally speaking be uh, given as a constant as opposed to just you know, memorizing a number. And then we have dot dot dot. So dot 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 in a technical sense is var args that is you can provide a variable number of arguments um yup that's a thing um unfortunately uh in this case it is uh not necessarily everything that you want it to be um there's no hints about what the correct thing is there's no like type uh, information or anything like that so it's um a bit of a pain in that regard uh we will use it for this one particular purpose so file descriptor command and then I've put as a comment here uh, a pointer to a, a struct f lock uh, and that is the argument that we are going to provide this function can do a lot of things and the third argument is only sometimes needed um, but we would fill it with just the one could they have like overloaded the function or provided a different name for this yeah that would have been great Unfortunately, this is what's in the standard, so we're kind of stuck with this. So we provide one flock structure and a command. What is an flock structure, you say? Well, it has the following definition. Uh, it consists of a type, a whence, a start, a len, and a PID. Some of these, but not all of them, are uh, things that we need to uh, provide. So um, first one is type. So type is whether we want to do a lock uh, of read lock or lock of write lock, uh, or we could use it to unlock. You know, this is the, the thing that we want to do. Whence, whence, yes, oh, very good, Mr. Shakespeare. But from whence, no, actually that's even redundant. Whence they came. Um, yeah, uh, fancy English language aside, whence is a uh, relative point in the file. So um, we're going to see uh, as, as we, um, as we um, use this that your choices are basically do you want to start at the beginning of the file or the end of the file or where we currently are in the file. So like where our read pointer is or something to that effect. So we have uh, the, the first argument lock type. Um, there are you know, read locks uh, which are compatible with other read locks. Write locks are not compatible with anything else uh, and then actually to um, unlock something you use the uh, f lock structure and you just call it with the argument of unlock right um, this is vulnerable to deadlock it's possible for a process to lock file one and need file two while another process has a lock on file two and needs the lock on file one so we still have to be careful with this just as we do uh, with all of our uh, uh, with all of our other uh, locking mechanisms. Now, um, once you will choose one of the following things, seek set is from the start of the file, uh, and then the start argument is the offset 
from your starting point. So if I choose whence as seek set and start as a thousand, it means that the lock begins at 1000 bytes past the start of the file. And so if you choose um, seek end, it means uh, from the end of the file. So you calculate your uh, offset relative to L whence. If you give minus a thousand, it will be a thousand bytes before seek end. You can actually lock after the end of the file. Uh, as we'll see, uh, and if you lock after the end of the file, you know, it's not that you're locking nothing, even though there isn't any data there. It's more along the lines of you are making it so only you can add things to the end of the file. Uh, and if you choose seek cur, uh, it's uh, where your pointer is currently uh, based in the file. If you've positioned it using seek, this makes a certain amount of sense. Uh, and again, your offset is calculated from there. The other uh, two parameters, uh, length and PID, uh, have to do with, well, uh, the length, respectively. So, you know, how much of the file do you want to lock? So based on the starting location, which is specified between whence and start, then length says, okay, once you go to that start point, how many bytes from there do we lock? Um, so that part is, uh, is the norm. Uh, and then PID is if you want to get information with the get lock function, uh, that will actually um, tell you uh, about the information that you received. Uh, and so you can, in fact, um, ask. If someone has this file locked, you can learn about that. Now, um, for command, uh, that is back to the... Uh, we'll go back to, to show it the uh, file control function. The second argument here, command, we'll assume we have populated our um, lock pointer uh, as we need. Um, then you know, what do we do for the command? There's get lock, set lock, and set lock w. Okay, so get lock uh, is determine if the lock uh, described by your structure is blocked. It's good if it's in use by some other lock. If a lock exists, then whatever data you passed in uh, as your struct f lock is overwritten with the data of the existing lock. If no such lock exists, then the uh, data that you get is just uh, the state, uh, the L type field is set to unlocked. Okay. Um, so is get lock real useful? I mean, yes and no. Um, like we've talked about in a couple of contexts, you know, for example, when it comes to semaphores and things like that, um, it's not actually super helpful because it, we could check and see is there a lock now, but between the time we get that information and the time we act on it, the situation could change because this is not atomic and therefore um, it's kind of unreliable in that regard. So we shouldn't uh, count too much on, on this behavior. Uh, it is there for your information purposes if you want. Um, it could be useful if you wanted to just like tell the user why they can't open a file right now, but you can't make any decisions based on it. Otherwise, you, you'll just uh, make the wrong decisions. Okay, uh, and then there are the set lock commands, you know, set lock and set lock w. So set the lock as described by our lock structure. If the lock cannot be acquired, then the return value of the uh, file control function returns an error and sets the error number variable. Uh, and that is try lock behavior. If you use the uh, command with the w on the end, that's blocking behavior. w is for wait, uh, and that means that we will actually wait uh, until we acquire the lock before we are able to proceed. So you choose which one you want. Okay, so let's look at an example. Um, but first, actually, we should uh, consider unlocking. So when you want to unlock uh, a region just as you would for locking, you specify what uh, part of the file you want to unlock. Partial unlocking seems kind of strange. Um, we've never really considered that sort of thing before, but there's no reason why you can't. The system will combine or split locks as appropriate based on what you said should be locked or unlocked. So, okay, here's a um, example of how to acquire a write lock on a file and uh, unlock a file. Uh, and it probably uh, is the case that you would want to um, 
just put this in a function because why should you repeat yourself so many times? But to write lock a file, uh, given a file descriptor, um, yeah, the uh, the slide calls the variable up here file descriptor, but then uses it in the call here as fd. Uh, that's corrected already in the notes, but uh, just keep that in mind. This should be uh, fd here uh, in the function signature and the same thing here. So you declare the lock structure that you want, uh, and we will say uh, we want a write lock. It's consistent with the name of the file, uh, name of the function. Uh, and then we will say the start point is zero. Uh, so the offset from the starting location is zero. Uh, and the seek set, so the uh, starting location is the beginning of the file. And length is zero. Okay, length is zero is a special case. Um, if length is zero, it means lock the entire file. Uh, and locking the entire file um, not only covers, you know, actually the you know, file data as it presently exists, uh, but it covers past the end of the file as well. So it prevents anybody else from appending to that file if our intention is to do the same. Okay, and unlock is straightforward, although yeah, it does uh, contain the same error here where uh, it's a file descriptor here, uh, even though it should be FD. Uh, and we want to unlock the entire segment of the file, so all of it, just uh, declare a lock. Set the type to be unlock, start is zero, whence is zero, length is zero, uh, and then actually perform the command. Whether it succeeds or not, we don't know, but we return that value to the caller, and it's the caller's job to check and see if everything went well or badly. Um, obviously, you can do more with this. Um, if, if you choose different uh, values in the structure, you can uh, get different behavior that corresponds to what we discussed, such as locking only a part of the file. Um, so you know, for, uh, for this uh, example, we're going to now lock just a part of the file with a read lock only. We're going to start from the beginning of the file, uh, and then from byte 1024, we're going to lock the next 256 bytes. Um, sorry, actually, we're going to uh, check if that is locked. So we'll open a file, example.txt gives us a file descriptor. We'll declare our lock structure. Uh, we will then say we want a read lock of these bytes. We want to know, does there exist a read lock uh, here? Uh, and uh, or would we succeed in acquiring this lock really uh, and we'll check and see uh, so if the lock is unlocked then sure you know continue carry on uh, if there is a write lock then the file is locked by a different process but as I was saying earlier this kind of thing is not great because once again there is a time delay between when we get the information and then when we take a decision based on it. If our only objective was to just say hey the file is currently locked by this process that's helpful I suppose you know, in telling the user what's going on uh, but we shouldn't really make decisions based on that. Uh, because, yeah, as this slide kind of explains, um, read a value and then you know, choose whatever to do next is not atomic. What you should do is use set lock to try to acquire the lock. Uh, and if we acquire the lock, then you can proceed. Um, if negative one was returned, we have uh, a, a, a locked lock, which we cannot... Uh, acquire right now. So locking was not successful. Uh, you could either wait, uh, in which case you would just use the lock W or do something else in the meantime. We already know how to do, um, do try lock behavior from our earlier discussion, so this is very much the same. Now, uh, immutability is for cowards. Um, this is something that happens a lot in Unix function calls, uh, and you're going to hear me complain about it uh, when we talk about select uh, in uh, a brief little while. Uh, and it is something that isn't, uh, isn't that nice. The function file control changes some of the values of the argument that you provide it. So if your intention is to reuse that structure, you have to reset that structure. That is, you have to like reconfigure it with everything that you want to make sure that it you know, is containing the right values. Uh, you can use uh, a, the same one. I mean, again, if you just reset the values, that's fine. But also, um, when you uh, acquire a lock, 
You can use that lock later in the unlock call. You just have to be a little careful about it. Uh, did we actually succeed in acquiring the lock? Uh, and if we did, then it is safe to proceed on that basis. Um, yeah, um, even then you might be defensive and you might say, actually, I don't think I want to do this. Uh, I think I would prefer to uh, reinitialize or recreate the uh, structure to make sure it is exactly containing what I expect. So, yeah, we should be um, cautious about that. Judean People's Front. No, we're the People's Front of Judea. Okay, uh, sometimes the name that you want is taken. Uh, you know, we've learned about uh, F-lock as a way of locking a file, uh, and you know, that, uh, well, is one way, and we've learned about how to use the uh, file control function to do it. Uh, and there's a third way, and the name that we want is taken, so we're going to use lock F. So you know, instead of file lock, lock file, Judean people's front, people's front of Judea, whatever you like. Um, unfortunately there exists a possibility of confusion right you know um getting mixed up between lock f and f lock is a legitimate concern it's yeah um i mean you'll become familiar with them when you are working with them if you try to compile them then you'll be told immediately if you know, your arguments are wrong and you, you have the wrong one um but if you were just writing it by hand this could be a bit of an issue anyway File control is super flexible. It can do all kinds of stuff that uh, we well, mostly don't need. If you just want the simple version where it's going to be, we'd like to lock a file, there is lock F. Uh, and lock F asks a lot less of you as the caller. And what do I mean by asks less of you as a caller? Well, you don't have to provide quite as much detail. You don't have to give quite so many arguments. Uh, and you'll get some default ones, but it's fine. Uh, and you may have encountered this if you're ever working with a function that requires you to provide like eight or ten parameters or something. And you're thinking like, why? Why do I have to do this? Why can't there be a simple version? And your uh, request has been fulfilled. We have lockf. So lockf takes a file descriptor and a command, uh, and instead of a structure that describes in some detail the portion of the file that you want to lock, just, well, an offset the uh, type, and that is the length. So the first parameter is like self-explanatory. It is the parameter uh, that's the file. Nothing new or exciting there. Uh, and command can be one of the following four things. Lock, tlock, ulock, test. Lock. Tries to acquire an exclusive lock on a file or the section of the file depending on uh, what you provide uh, tlock is the try lock behavior so yeah um, unfortunately another inconsistency in the way that the uh, API works uh, as file control uh, the command for just lock is the try lock one the non-blocking one you have to do lock with W if you want to wait with lock F, lock by default is the blocking one, and T lock is the try lock non blocking one. Not consistent, I know. Uh, gnash your teeth. Um, it's too late to change it now because it's in the specification. There are programs that rely on it, but that's uh, just life. Uh, and length is an offset uh, as the last argument, and it's based on the current position of the file. If zero is provided, that just means lock the entire file, please and thank you. Uh, in which case, it doesn't matter where our pointer is uh, in, the, uh, in the offset or anything. Um, so we might have read some data or not. We don't have to like seek back to the beginning of the file. If you want to lock the whole file, you could just choose zero. Okay. Um, and there's another thing that's nice about lockf, uh, which is that, well, the file is automatically unlocked uh, when the file descriptor is closed. There is the unlock behavior, and you can call the file descriptor with the command f unlock, and you can specify that you want to unlock a segment of the file or the whole file. But if you're done with a file, closing the file descriptor does this automatically. So that's nice. 
Uh, and ftest, what does it do? Well, it checks if the file or a section of the file is locked. Uh, it will return zero if it is unlocked and negative one if it is locked. So that uh, can be used again to just sort of poke around and see, you know, is the file locked at the moment? Once again, I remind you, um, don't make decisions based on that. Uh, it's you know for entertainment purposes only, um, but it's there in the specification, so I'll tell you about it. Um, so depending on your system, how LockF is implemented could vary. Um, it's usually not a big deal uh, you know, how a particular system call is implemented because we don't really have to know, uh, but on some systems, LockF just you know packages up and calls uh, f file control. Almost said the wrong one, caught myself. Uh, but on other systems, it uses a different mechanism, so don't mix and match. If you lock a file using one of the mechanisms, you should unlock it with its matching unlock routine uh, and not try to use the other one because you could get unpredictable behavior uh, depending on how it is actually implemented on your system. So you do have to be at least a little bit careful with, uh, with locking and unlocking. Now, uh, I want to add one more thing about locks uh, that we have talked about. And this limitation is that locks are advisory only. What do I mean by advisory? That is, like the use of a semaphore or mutex, it's only really effective if every thread or every process that wants to access a shared resource follows the protocol and checks if access is permitted or not. So when you do this with you know, a mutex, we have some shared variable, we have a mutex associated with it, and every thread has to lock and unlock the mutex when uh, entering and exiting the critical section to make sure that the shared data is not manipulated by more than one thread at the same time. This, however, only works correctly if all the threads do it because a thread could just not lock and access the shared variable and nothing actually stops that from happening. Right? I mean, it's a race condition. Um, it, it is you know, potentially going to lead to incorrect outcomes in your program. It's not a good idea. It shouldn't happen. But nothing actually prevents the race condition from occurring. Mandatory locks do exist. There is the ability in Unix like operating system that allows you to actually really enforce the rule so that somebody who wants to you know, access a file that you have locked using mandatory locks cannot. They are difficult to use and they are not recommended. The notes link to an article uh, in the uh, kernel org uh, documentation um, which says um, why you should avoid mandatory locking. The uh, original version of this was written in oh, 1996 and it was updated um, 2007 or something. Um, but basically mandatory locks say um, on, uh, on Linux don't work. Um, it says that um, the well if you really want to know um, <laughs> i mean the notes link you to the full description as to why this is the case but i'll tell you um just as a brief overview the uh, executive summary that's in that document uh number one the right system call checks a mandatory lock only once at its start so it's possible for a lock request to be granted after the check but before the data is modified so that's not cool uh, similarly, an exclusive lock may be granted after a read has been started, but before the read is actually completed, uh, and therefore a uh, reader might see some intermediate state. Uh, and uh, other races make mutual exclusion between lock and uh, mmap unreliable. So basically, the uh, actual implementation is prone to a number of difficult-to-fix race conditions, which make it unreliable for its purpose. Um, there's another warning in there is that not even a root user, so an administrator, can override a mandatory lock. Um, so uh, a runaway process can lock crucial files and do bad things. Um, and you know, this is not good either. So, um, yeah. So it turns out, um, although there does exist the ability to you know, lock files, mandatory locks, 
by default, uh, it's disabled on all file systems. So I can't even show you a good example of it, even if I wanted to. Um, and only an administrator can, you know, well, it, mount that file system. That's the uh, that's the verb for it. Uh, and only if the um, only if the user uh, user who does this is an administrator with the correct permissions and allows configuring this. Um, so no, there are no mandatory locks. We are not doing mandatory locks. I want you to know that they exist, um, just in case you were wondering. But they should not uh, should not be used. Don't do it, please. Okay. Um, I am become lock controller of files. Um, so there's one more thing that I can tell you about um, the existence of um, concurrency with file systems uh, in, in this part of the topic, and it is using a file itself as a lock. That is, use the very existence of a file as a way of controlling your concurrency. And you may have seen this, for example, um, if you um, use git. Git places a file called index.lock in a particular directory to indicate that an operation is in progress. Thus, two systems, you know, um, so like I, I'm here on computer A and uh, I'm looking at um, this, uh, this folder in uh, my uh, Unix account, so log into uh, EC Ubuntu and I uh, do some git operation, so git pull. Uh, and concurrently, I have a second tab open that's also logged in to EC Ubuntu. If I try to do um, git pull in that window, it will fail. It will say, um, actually, there's another operation in progress. And how does it know that? Well, it is because there's an index file. Now, if your git client crashes, this index file might not get removed, so you might have to <laughs> delete it uh, by hand if you actually want to be able to do things in that repository again. Um, but the existence of that index file is a way to make sure that two operations don't get started or don't run concurrently. Why this approach as opposed to something else? Well, um, the repository itself is you know, like the uh, state on disk is you know the uh, data that's being operated on. In theory, a shared drive could be operated on from different systems. Um, this is already the case uh, with your Unix account uh, at the university. Uh, that you, you can access the same data from ECE Ubuntu 1 as you would from ECE Tesla 0, even though they're two distinct machines uh, and there are significant differences between them. Uh, but your home directory is mounted on a shared drive. Uh, and so there isn't really any other good way to make sure that two clients, so one that's running on EC Ubuntu 1 and one of them that's running on EC Tesla 0, uh, aren't both operating on this repository at the same time, you know, unless you know, mandatory locks were used, but they're not, so forget that they exist. So yeah, I mean, what do we, uh, what do we do? If you want to check uh, this, um, if your goal is you're writing a program and you want to use this kind of behavior, um, then you can try using open. Um, but the reason why it, it's, you know, you open index lock uh, as opposed to some other arbitrary file in the repository um, is that um, you actually want your process to create the file using open uh, and not just open an existing file. Why? Because we can make creation fail if we didn't create the file. If the file already existed, creation will fail, uh, and that's something that is better than trying to open an existing file. Uh, and, I mean, how do we do that? Well, we use the flags parameter of the open system call. Uh, and we've seen a number of examples of open already. Um, we've also done fopen, but we're just going to use the regular open one uh, in this example. Uh, and so the ones that we want to talk about today are open, rename, and remove. Uh, those are the relevant functions. Obviously, this is not an exhaustive list uh, of the file manipulation functions, as we already know. So open takes the file name, and the file name can be given as an absolute path, so slash home, slash username, slash ec252, slash example.c, uh, or a relative name, just uh, open and then in, in the string, uh, which 
const char star is a string here, you know, uh, example.c, and then flags. Uh, and flags uh, can be uh, combined using the bitwise or operators, little pipe symbol. Uh, and the flags are shown in the table here at the bottom of the slide. Obviously, not all of them um, work super well together, but you know, uh, read only, open the file for reading only, write only, open the file only for writing, read write. So both reading and writing are allowed. Uh, append, put information at the end of the file. Truncate, which uh, just keeps the file, but it dumps all the contents. They all get uh, deleted. Uh, and create the file if it doesn't exist uh, is is this o create option. Uh, and then there's o exclusive. Uh, and thing is that if you just call open with a file name and you say create, if the file doesn't exist, it will be created. Uh, if it does exist, then you'll just open it. If, however, you uh, combine create and exclusive, then we will try to create the file. And if we are successful, then the file is created and uh, we uh, return the um, file descriptor. If we are unsuccessful, we did not create the file. That's because the file already exists. It fails. So this allows us, uh, because this open call uh, is, uh, is atomic in this regard, allows us to try creating the file in the git example index.lock if we were successful then the lock is ours and we may proceed now the repository is uh, is not being modified by anyone else right now and therefore uh, it's okay for us to make changes if we tried to open index.lock and failed uh, it means that the file does exist and we give up now obviously uh, again this relies on the fact that it is atomic um, because um, ultimately, uh, if you just tried to open the file uh, and, it, uh, and it was not atomic, uh, who knows if the file got created in the meantime. So in this regard, we are fortunate. When we're done, we would use remove, and remove deletes a file, uh, delete the lock file, and it would let the next process try. So that's a way that we could control access to this repository uh, by using this index lock file. We'll create it. If we create it, proceed. If we don't, we fail. Print an error message to the user and say try again. Uh, when we're done, we do remove on that newly created file. That's the step that might be missing if your Git client crashes, so you might have to delete it manually, but no, that's hopefully not a common occurrence. Okay, so that covered open and remove, but what's rename doing on there? I mean, the function signature for rename is really straightforward. Uh, given the old file name, change it to the new file name. But what makes rename interesting is it's atomic. So um, we can team up both open and rename to get lock-like behavior on different programs that share nothing except a common file system. So the open call is used to create the lock file and fail if it already exists, um, but we can also rename and use, well, this has a lock as well. So to lock, change the name. To unlock, change it back. Okay, so um, here is a quick example of using the file as a lock. Uh, I've done this um, using threads, but obviously uh, it would usually be different processes, and in fact, different processes would probably be on different systems even. But no reason why this doesn't work. Um, you could argue maybe it's inefficient to you know, use the, a file on disk uh, to do this, but all, all that's interesting right now is, does it work? Is it correct? So, okay, uh, we have to include a whole bunch of headers, our standard I.O., standard library, file control, Unix standard, stat uh, is used in like, getting the size of a file or uh, getting files data, uh, types, and then pthread.h, and we'll have 10 threads, all of which want to uh, access this shared variable here, uh, and shared is initialized to zero. So each thread that wants to run void star run, void star argument, uh, and uh, we'll cast the argument here. And what we'll try to do is rename file.lock to file.locked you know, with the uh, uh, ed on the end. If that fails, it returns negative one. So we're going to wait. Uh, in this case, you know, what we actually do is just like print a message out that, uh, that tells, uh, tells us what's happening. Usually you would try to sleep or do something useful in the meantime. Um, it, when we are successful in this, tight polling as it is, 
then we will print out thread and our ID number is in the critical section, increment the value of shared uh, and uh, print out a message saying so. Uh, and then we will rename the file locked again with the ED back to lock without it as our unlock. And then we will exit. And uh, before we do so, we'll remember to deallocate memory. Okay, so um, yeah, a writer here, um, you know, so write data implementation is uh, is not shown uh, in this case. Actually, the uh, writer thread here is uh, apparently redundant. Um, yes, it's apparently redundant, so uh, it's left over from a previous example. We can ignore that. Uh, and our main function will open the file dot lock. Uh, presupposing it doesn't already exist. Uh, and if that fails, then we'll just indicate file creation failed and we'll exit. Uh, and then we will create num threads. That was uh, set to 10 on the previous, uh, previous slide. And then we will create 10 threads. We'll allocate an ID for each of those uh, as, uh, as we need so we can get the output that we're looking for uh, and pass it in. Uh, and then we will join each of those threads uh, and we will uh, close the lock file when all the threads are done and we can then delete the lock file entirely. So going back to the uh, using the file as a lock, does this work? I mean, yes. This uh, does do what we expect it to do. As I say, it might be kind of inefficient uh, in that we're using a file to do this and we, you know, we have sort of a tight polling behavior where every thread tries repeatedly to lock the file before, uh, before going on. But yeah, we can use rename as a mechanism for uh, concurrency because rename is atomic. Uh, and if every thread that wants to enter the critical section is trying to rename the file from file.lock to dot .locked, then no problem. Okay, um, one of the things about this is there does still exist the possibility that a uh, thread forgets to unlock the file, right? We didn't, uh, if, if we exited somewhere in the middle here uh, of our critical section before we rename file.locked back to file.lock, then other threads would not be able to proceed because they are waiting because you know, the file is not named the right thing. One tiny advantage that we have uh, in this situation over uh, that normal situation where a thread might exit without um, pthread mutex unlock uh, is that here the file is in the file system, so we could actually rename it ourselves, which would or delete it ourselves and recreate it, which would allow uh, other threads to then proceed. That sounds good, and sometimes it's okay. Sometimes that's actually nice because it allows us to manually unstick something that already got stuck. But it's also potentially dangerous because if we just assumed that it was stuck, even though it wasn't, uh, then we might change the name manually, and it ends up being um, it ends up being something that lets a second thread into the critical section at the same time. So we do have to be a little bit careful. Um, nevertheless, you know, this is a mechanism for organizing coordination between two systems that share nothing except the common file system. Uh, and normally I think I would have to motivate a little better when that would happen, why it would matter, um, but we already know why, and it was covered uh, in, in the earlier discussion, uh, in that this is what happens, say, on like EC Ubuntu versus EC Tesla. You have many different uh, servers and they all have a shared file system, so uh, we can see immediately why this is potentially uh, an issue. So uh, that's where we're going to end for now. Uh, when we come back again, uh, our next topic is uh, the other part of concurrency in file systems. Uh, and that one uh, takes us a little bit further afield uh, than uh, just using a file for a lock, um, but it gives us kind of more of a high level look at, uh, at how file systems uh, manage the concurrency that's inherent to them. So that's it. See you in the next video.